Hi, I'm James and welcome to another video looking at the Twilight 2000 Referees Manual. Today we're going to look at Chapter 2, uh, which is Encounters. So, let's see what we've actually got within this. Well, there's a fair bit of guidance for the referee. For example, it talks about the consequences. If the characters do something, what would, might be the result? So it looks at that. Now, encounters are pretty frequent. Um, there's 52 of them in the game, um, which is basically designed to match playing cards. Now, it says you'll need to draw one potential encounter for every 10 kilometer hex they enter, and one encounter per shift if they're stationary. A shift is five to 10 hours. So there are going to be potentially a lot of encounters. It might seem to a lot of players that the best thing to do is to stay put and avoid encounters, and we'll look at how that works in a minute. If you're in a city, then they're going to be more frequent. It says to draw them for every one kilometer hex. In densely populated areas, it could even be more common. It mentions about spotting, and it refers to the player's manual for the distance that they're encountered on. Now, each of the encounters has got symbols on. There's a, a road symbol, which is a picture of a road, or there's an off-road symbol, which is a picture of what looks like a tree, or it can have both. And the encounter only applies if you're in that appropriate type of uh, travel mode. So there are a lot more on-road encounters than off-road, which is nice and realistic. So if you are trying to avoid people, travelling cross-country is for you. Uh, you've also got another symbol on there. You've got either a sun or a moon or both. Uh, and again, this affects when you come across them. Some of the encounters only occur during the day. Some only occur at night. And predictably, the bulk of the encounters will occur during the day. So travelling by night cross-country is probably your best bet if you're trying to avoid things. Sometimes, however, the players are stationary. And there's an extra symbol, which is a campfire. And this will, is again rarer so you don't get that as often. Now as well as that there are some rules for staying put because what they work on the principle of is that the longer you stay put the more somebody local will notice you and there is a, a table which gets a plus for every um, time that you, you roll on it. It could be an ordinary encounter you might come across refugees, stragglers, scouts, or potentially a large force. So somebody has noticed the player characters and comes to investigate. So it's quite a nice concept. Um, I'm not sure if the encounters are a bit too frequent. I think that's something that will only turn up during play. But it's not a hard job to change that if you feel that they are too common. So next thing we've got is a set of typical NPCs. And you've got refugees, civilians, hunters, marauders. And then you've got US, Soviet, Polish and Swedish. The Poles and Swedes have just got officers and soldiers. The American and Soviet have got soldiers, officers, special forces and intelligence. So you do have that. I'm a little confused as to why they thought there was a need to put separate statistics in for each of the nationalities. I think just because the statistics are all the same, I think very simply just making a note that the, an appropriate assault rifle rather than specifying which one. Um, they've done that with a marauder, so I couldn't understand why they didn't do it with that. And it would just give you uh, a simpler chart. But it's not unreasonable, and it does give, to a degree, an idea what the soldiers will carry. So there's also a few animals. You've got wild dogs, wolves, bears and vipers. That's not a bad selection. These are only ones that are going to attack you. There's nothing that is harmless. So, yeah, okay. Uh, there's also some mood elements and rumours, um, which I'll look at uh, later on. So, the way it works is whenever you're told you may have an encounter, you draw a card. And when you draw the card, two is a weather event, three animal, four derelict vehicle, five is a crater, six ruin, seven refugees, eight hunters, nine marauders, ten stragglers, jack a military patrol, queen a military outpost, king a military convoy and an ace is a settlement. And the suit gives a clue as to how the encounter is going to go with clubs being violence, diamonds being wealth, hearts being fellowship and spades being power. 
So you would draw the card and look at it. Now there is a minor snag with this version of the rules uh, in that they've put them in but they haven't specified particularly well, at least on my printed version, the um, suit. It is there but it's almost a magnifying glass to see it and I actually missed it on the first time through. So when you're printing it you might I've printed mine in a reasonable quality. If you print it at high quality, you might be able to see it better. Uh, and no doubt the printed copy will be a lot better. So let's actually have a go and see what we get. Uh, I've got the pack of cards. I'll give them a quick shuffle. And top card we've got is the Five of Hearts. So let's actually go to the Five of Hearts. So there's quite a few different options within it. Um, so this one will only occur if you're on a road, but it can be night or day. If you're camping or traveling cross country, you won't come across it. And say so it's called the watering hole. Let's see what it says. The PCs approach a crater from a nuclear strike. The crater is 2d6 hexes wide and twice that many meters deep. There is a pond of scummy water in the bottom of it and D6 deer are drinking from it. The PCs can try to kill the deer for food, see the rules for hunting in the player's manual, no roll for tracking the animals needed only to shoot it. Eating the meat will, uh, from the deer will cause one rad. The entire visible crater as well as an area twice as wide around it is still radioactive. Moving through this area it fits one rad every stretch. The road is destroyed here. To pass around the crater, a vehicle needs to go off-road and lose one hex of movement this shift, modified by terrain, before movement can continue. So that was a fairly simple, straightforward encounter. I think we'll do, we'll do another one, so I'll put that one back into the deck. And let's see what we get this time. The Seven of Hearts. So let's see what that one comes out as. So, Seven of Hearts. Okay, now this one can be on a road or cross country and can occur night or day, but wouldn't occur again if it was in a, um, a campsite. So the faction is civilian and it says number three. So there's three um, people encountered. A lot of them will do it in multiples of PC numbers, so PCs times two or whatever. So this one's called the Orphans. The PCs see a farm up ahead, largely intact. If they move in to investigate, they will come across three children living in the farm. The parents left them months ago to go and find help and food, and the kids, aged 10 to 15, have had to fend for themselves. One of them has a double-barreled shotgun with one reload. They are very suspicious of strangers, but the PCs can calm their fears with a successful persuasion role. On the farm, there is a total of 2d6 rations of domestic food left. If the PCs leave the kids, they will spot a band of PC times 2 marauders armed with AKMs approaching the farm. They will kill the children and steal the food unless stopped. It's not a particularly pleasant world, is Twilight 2000. Um, one thing I did pick up with the marauders through this um, is they all seem to be carrying RPG 16s instead of RPG 7s. I would suggest that that probably needs changing as the RPG-16 was only used by the airborne troops. Um, I am going to put that on the feedback because Free League have asked for feedback. Uh, it's a relatively simple fix. Um, worst case you could probably do that, you could amend that yourself anyway. Um, so we've got a nice range of encounters there. Now there are extra things in there as well. Um, we mentioned earlier we've got radio chatter rumors and mood elements now it says for these that you can actually spend a whole um, sec whole uh, shift monitoring the radio and see what you pick up nice and straightforward uh, it does point out range the ranges of radio so bear in mind where that has come from so one lucky character gets to sit there doing radio watch as a friend of mine, Neil, would put it, it's like Baywatch, but far less interesting. Uh, the rumours, again, they're, they're fairly straightforward. Um, it's, it does know, it's up to you to decide if they're true or false. And mood elements. Uh, it talks about sort of rather than just having a wasteland, there's things to look at. 
So let's have a look then. We'll have a look at the radio chat. I haven't got a D10 handy, so I'll just use a quick split of the deck and I get a 10. So let's see what a 10 is for radio chatter. A cryptic voice repeats a string of seemingly random numbers and letters, then suddenly utters the words Operation Reset. Then the message starts over. The message is in code, but the PCs have no way of deciphering it at this point. The Operation Reset is obviously the big overarching thing that they use, but that's relatively um, straightforward. Uh, part of me would be tempted with these radio chatter to actually record them and play them as an audio file, and that would work particularly nicely. So, rumours. see what we get for the rumour, and we get a six. So, a group of marauders has discovered... So, it began taking slaves a month ago. Some of the newly acquired forced labourers are remnants of the 5th Infantry Division, wounded soldiers from a field hospital, no less. The PCs might be able to rescue them, but the marauders are said to be powerful. OK, that's, again, a nice, simple... Uh, rumour. So let's have a look at mood elements. Now these are split between woods, road and fields. So we'll do one from each. We'll be in a generous mood. So we've got a nine. So the mood element for a road for a nine. An old checkpoint. Uneven terrain lies on either side of the road, further littered with steel hedgehogs. Sandbags lay atop crushed cars, providing a place for a machine gun emplacement, although the weapon itself is long gone. While there may have been a gate there are oil barrels piled 3D. Whoever left this post didn't want anyone getting through easily. So that's straightforward. So what about if we're moving through the woods and we get a six? Let's see what that says. A yellow school bus sits in the middle of the road. Rust flakes along the sides and top. The windows are spider webbed with cracks. Tires are flat. The whole thing has sunk several inches into the earth. A tombstone lays to one side and next to it the skull and femur of someone else. The last resident... So the rest of the last resident was no doubt taken by animals some time ago. And then that leaves the fields. And for that one, OK, we've got the bridge scoring card. That's not a lot of use for doing this. Jack, we've got a bit higher than what we need. We've got a five. We finally get there. So the fields then. The breeze stirs the tall grass, then shifts, causing it to sway in unison, like people do at fervent religious events or once did at concerts. A few wild dogs poke their heads out, sniff at the air, then disappear back to wherever they came from. So then, quite a few encounters in there to use. We've got 52 encounters. I think the tables probably could do with being expanded. They are, it will show up with 10 and you would find yourself repeating them fairly quickly. Uh, the encounters are good. They're quite varied. There's a nice little bit of artwork uh, with it as well. Um, one person has picked up, I know on the forums, that there is uh, an issue with... Um, wild dogs in that they're rabid uh, which is going to be quite rare and uh, they suggested they're rolling a six-sided dice and it becomes rabid dogs on a six otherwise it's just um, ordinary, wild, ordinary wild dogs that don't appear. Um, so th th there are some nice sort of thoughts going into this. Um, there will be a lot of moral choices for the PCs particularly when you have starving refugees and so on. Do you give up your, some of your kit uh, and it's going to bring a lot of the motivations and moral side of the character generation into it. So again, there's a lot of thought has gone into this. Um, part of me is considering with these, printing them all out, putting them on cards and then adding extra cards so I can put things in that I specifically want for my campaign. They're pretty flexible. They would work nicely for either Sweden or for um, Poland. I think they would work in other areas. Some of them wouldn't work particularly well for the UK, where I do a lot of my games, admittedly. But generally, you can modify them. They are just there as a guide. Free League are very good at pointing out this is a guide. You, it's your game. You modify it to suit yourself. So plenty, plenty of good ideas in there. Some nice thoughts, of, um, some scenarios that I've gone, ooh, that could be a good encounter and you can easily expand on it. Again, like I said for the locations, the emphasis is on a sensible switched on referee. It won't work particularly well, I don't think, for novices, because there will be a lot of thinking to do with some of these. And how do I handle this? What if that? What about? They're the bare bones of encounters. You, it's possible it's worth generating them in advance, and then you can obviously expand on what you've got, got handy. 
hope you're going to find that useful. Uh, please let me know in the comments. I'm always interested to see what you think because it helps me then decide future videos. Speak to you soon for, with another review.